Well, I uh, hope everyone enjoyed uh, your lunch and the breakout sessions this afternoon. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Jonathan Dixon, uh, who is the Secretary General of the International Association of Insurance Supervisors. And you know, in the insurance business, we love our acronyms, so I'm just gonna say uh, IAIS from here on out. So uh, Jonathan is a speaker who truly lives up to the Global Insurance Symposium's billing uh, as a, a global symposium. We're very fortunate to, to have him here. I did ask him if he had been to Iowa before, and he said he had not. Uh, so we need to give him a proper, you know, Midwest welcome when we when we do that, and uh, to help him understand Iowa a little bit. He spent he said he spent quite a bit of time uh, visiting Kansas City at the NEIC and been to Illinois. So um, hopefully we can help him uh, learn a little more about Iowa, and we can get him here a little off, more often. So uh, he is the Secretary General of IAIS, as I said. Prior to becoming Secretary General, uh, Mr. Dixon had a long association with the IAIS, having been a member of the IAIS Executive Committee since 2009 and chair of its Implementation Committee since 2012. He also chaired the Governing Council of the Access to Insurance Initiative, a joint initiative of the IIS and development partners aimed at strengthening responsible and inclusive insurance. Prior to joining the organization, Mr. Dixon was deputy executive officer at the Financial Services Board of South Africa with responsibility for insurance regulation and supervision. He was appointed to this position by the Minister of Finance in 2008. Before that, he worked for 10 years in the National Treasury of South Africa on economic and financial sector policy issues. We're very fortunate to have you here, and we thank you for coming. And please welcome Mr. Dixon to the podium. So good afternoon, everyone. And it's uh, uh, thank you, Eric, uh, for that very warm welcome and that uh, very Iowa nice uh, introduction as well, which is perfect. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, Commissioner Oman. Uh, it is fantastic uh, to have the opportunity to come here and to hear about all the great things uh, that are going on in, in Iowa. So thank you uh, again. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here in the in the U.S. heartland uh, of insurance, um, uh, and it's 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 fantastic to be here in person and see what is what is going on in in, in Iowa, um, but also to provide uh, all of you, I hope, with a bit of a perspective of what is happening uh, on insurance supervision at at the global level, uh, at the International Association of Insurance Supervision or the, the, uh, the, the easily um, pronounced IAIS. So thank you for the time. And today, um, I'd like to, to fill you in on where we are, uh, the IAIS, what we're busy with. In particular, uh, two issues. First, how the IAIS and all of our members have responded to uh, the global financial crisis some 10 years back now, and in particular, the reforms that we are busy finalizing as, as the last piece, in a way, of a response to that crisis. And secondly, uh, to outline what is next for the IIS, what is on our next strategic uh, horizon as we look to our strategic plan for the fi next five years, 2020, to 2024, because what happens uh, at the global level, what happens in our global discussions, ultimately it does trickle down to the domestic level. Likewise, all of us uh, at the IIS level learn from what is happening uh, at the, in domestic markets and in forums like this in Iowa. But before I start, maybe a little bit of, uh, for those who are less familiar with the IS, a little bit of context, a little bit about our mission. So as the global standard setting body for insurance supervision, our 217 members uh, from around the world, regulators and supervisors uh, from jurisdictions representing 97% uh, of the world insurance uh, market, um, 
we come together and we work to promote effective and globally consistent supervision of the insurance industry and to contribute to global financial stability. And we do this because we recognize that in a world uh, in which the insurance sector itself is globally interconnected, uh, it demands a global response uh, to global challenges. We do this by coming together, uh, assessing global trends, and, and developing effective supervisory responses, either new global standards which guide supervision around the world, or uh, lessons about proactive supervisory practices. What we do not do is determine domestic legislation. It's up to each jurisdiction to decide how to implement our standards, taking into account local circumstances while still achieving comparable outcomes and a little bit more on that later. Just to say, our members from the NEIC and our US stakeholders have always had a leading role uh, in the IIS. So, uh, Eric, little known fact, uh, the IIS was incorporated actually not that far from here, uh, in Springfield, Illinois, of all places, uh, exactly 25 years ago. And back then, the IIS was established as a forum to exchange perspectives on supervisory practices and to promote global supervisory cooperation, goals that remain just as relevant today as they were back then. So that's the history of the IIS. Where are we now? So 2019, we stand really, at the, in a way, at the juncture between the past and the future. We're on the brink of finalizing these, uh, the main development phase of these post-crisis reforms that I spoke about, uh, whilst at the same time charting a new course for the next phase of the IIS's journey. So let me cover each of these in turn. So first, finalizing the post-crisis reform agenda. So finalizing work on these reforms is our most immediate priority. Uh, and firstly, this means delivering on what we call ComFrame, or a common framework for the supervision of internationally active uh, insurance groups. And this includes our work on developing a global insurance capital standard, or ICS. On Comframe, we're close to finishing uh, development, uh, particularly on the qualitative elements. So that's the, the, the governance, risk management standards, uh, and we're busy ref doing final uh, adjustments to those standards before adoption in November. This will be uh, a significant milestone for the IIS. For the first time, we will have a truly globally consistent framework for the supervision of global groups for the first time. We're now preparing for the implementation uh, of ComFrame and discussing ways that the IIS can support its members from around the world and in Iowa as well, uh, to put uh, this framework into practice. On the ICS, the quantitative part of ComFrame, uh, there's still a fair amount of work to be done, but by the end of this year, we will have a version of ICS that will be used for the purposes of a five-year monitoring period which will see confidential reporting of the results of ICS by these internationally active insurance groups uh, to the IIS, uh, but also to group-wide supervisors in a confidential way uh, and in a way that doesn't trigger uh, supervisory action. This is because in this monitoring period, we are really still in a, uh, a refinement and assessment 
phase. And we will continue to assess and refine ICS during this five-year monitoring period as we monitor the usefulness of ICS as a practical tool for group-wide supervisors to do their job better. That is the purpose. Uh, this will involve practical feedback from supervisors, but equally important, also feedback from the global groups uh, on the challenges with applying ICS or any unintended consequences from, for parts of the insurance business, including for long-term business. It's no, uh, it's no easy task uh, designing a capital standard, a global capital standard, uh, for insurance, recognizing that there are wide uh, differences in business models uh, and regulatory systems around the world. People talk a lot about Basel III for banking and the challenges of that. Insurance is a more complex business than banking. Understandably, developing a global insurance capital standard is more complex too. But the alternative is, is, is truly suboptimal. A highly fragmented regulatory universe in which uh, group-wide supervisors often struggle to, to understand, uh, let alone act on, uh, the consolidated financial position of global groups. So that's why we are committed uh, as the IAS to finding the right balance a global standard that sufficiently takes into account different jurisdictional circumstances, but at the same time does not risk divergent local implementation of the standard in a way that leads to market fragmentation uh, and unlevel playing fields. It's a delicate balance. Flexibility in the local implementation of ICS is important, but it should also still lead to comparable outcomes. Uh, for instance, here in the US, supervisors have stated their intention to develop an aggregation method as an alternative to the consolidated market-adjusted valuation approach of ICS, which they hope will provide comparable outcomes to the ICS, and if so, be deemed an outcomes equivalent approach to the implementation uh, of ICS. This recognizes differences in insurance business models and the supervisory regime in, in the US. At the same time, clearly the issue is going to be agreeing on an appropriate definition uh, of comparable outcomes, guided by our supervisory objectives for ICS and ultimately our mission. It's a conversation that we've begun uh, within the IAS, but it's just the beginning. It's going to be an intense multi-year discussion. Secondly, on our post-crisis reforms, uh, include finalizing what we call an holistic framework for the assessment and mitigation of global systemic risk in the insurance sector. Now, up until now, uh, the global supervisory response to these systemic issues, mainly driven uh, by the Financial Stability Board in Basel, uh, has been the same for banks and insurers, focusing on specific entities that were seen as too big to fail. Over the past couple of years, the IIS has, has successfully shifted this conversation on the basis that banks are different to insurers, recognizing that core insurance business is unlikely to be globally systemically uh, important, but that there are certain activities that insurers do uh, that are bank-like in nature. So therefore, we have developed an holistic framework that aims to address both uh, potential systemic, global systemic risk that arises from these collective bank-like activities uh, at a sector-wide level across the globe, but also recognizing that if there is a concentration 
of these activities or these exposures in a particular insurer, that insurer could potentially still be systemically important. So we have a developed a holistic approach that focuses on activities but also looks at concentration in particular insurers. That's maybe interesting just to give a flavor of what's in this framework. So three elements, essentially. Firstly, it's a set of, the, it's the preemptive part. It's a set of supervisory requirements uh, to be applied in a proportionate way to try and, and head off the buildup of this systemic risk uh, and this, these activities. Um, secondly, it's a global monitoring exercise by the IIS uh, that, that assesses, surveys, and assesses the buildup of potential buildup of systemic risk, but building on uh, the macro potential uh, surveillance that is done by national supervisors. Plus, importantly, a collective discussion at this global level within the IIS of an appropriate response where there is systemic risk that's detected. So again, for the first time, a global response to global challenges, supervisors coming together to act collectively. Uh, and then lastly, the last element, a focus on assessment uh, of implementation, recognizing that ultimately the effectiveness of the framework depends on its timely and, uh, and complete implementation. I can say that the comments received during consultation at the end of last year on the framework have been very encouraging. Commentators are supportive of a more insurance-specific approach. Uh, the approach is also seen as broadly consistent with the domestic approach to macroprudential supervision that's been put in place in many jurisdictions, including by the NEIC uh, in the US. The final consultation on the framework will happen over this summer. Uh, before we adopt it in November. But just to flag, this will also have far-reaching implications for the IIS in years to come. So what's next for the IIS? Well, we will be gearing up to build our capacity not only in data collection and surveillance at a global level, but also uh, in the area of robust uh, assessment of implementation. So that's... That's the first part, the f delivering on the post-crisis reforms. But what's next? 2019, we'll also see a shift towards our next strategic plan for 2020 to 2024. Uh, and we took a step back. We looked at what's changing in the landscape. Uh, and it recognizes that as insurance supervisors, our core mandate is and will always be policyholder protection and financial stability. But at the same time, increasingly supervisors are being drawn into important societal policy debates on issues like uh, financial technology innovation, fintech, cyber risk, climate risk, sustainable development. So it really is, in a way, uh, I think it was the, was it the CEO of AXA that described us as a golden era for insurance. I think recognizing that insurance in this new world is really going to be at the forefront of many important societal debates around technology, climate, aging society, and so on. So it's an exciting time for a new strategy. These emerging and accelerating trends certainly present challenges and risks for supervisors, but also great opportunities. And what we will be doing as the IIS is to continue to be forward-looking and help shape proactive supervisory responses to this emerging insurance landscape. And our focus will be particularly on guidance on supervisory practices and less about setting new global standards. 
So today, uh, given the innovation focus of this symposium, I'd like to zero in on, on two particular areas in this new strategy, uh, fintech and cyber resilience. Uh, and, and certainly we've heard today about the huge benefits of uh, technological innovation in terms of the cost, access, quality of service. However, it's the job of supervisors to always be pessimistic as well. Um, and we know that some innovations could threaten the traditional insurance model in unhelpful ways for policyholder protection and exposing the sector to greater interconnectedness and hyper heightened uh, cyber vulnerabilities. So on FinTech, our members find themselves balancing the risks and benefits of innovation and debating appropriate supervisory responses. And let me give just three examples. So firstly, uh, on innovation facilitation. So the use of regulatory sandboxes and innovation hubs by supervisors has become significantly more common uh, across jurisdictions, across the world. We can see that in our members. Uh, it's great, these mechanisms can help facilitate learning of both supervisors and innovators and facilitate speedier access to, to markets for innovation. Um, what's, what, what's interesting is that some members have taken a much more uh, leading role, active role in encouraging innovations, while others have taken a more wait and see uh, approach. Uh, in terms of engagement from the insurance sector, we observe that the interest to date across jurisdictions uh, has been mostly from firms seeking to become insurance intermediaries rather than firms looking to become direct insurers themselves. Most new entrants seek to partner with uh, incumbent insurers. Uh, and our job will be to spread the lessons amongst our members about what people are doing in this area of facilitating innovation. Secondly, on operational resilience, uh, we know that insurers' increasing reliance on and exposure to specialist technology providers, particularly cloud providers, present supervisory challenges and risks. Uh, most supervisors have a, have a comprehensive set of expectations for firms on managing outsourcing risk, and it generally forms part of the standard supervisory approach. Uh, but firstly, that doesn't help much when you're a small to medium insurer trying to tell Apple what to do. Uh, and secondly, there's what we found is there's often supervisory gaps in the ability of individual, insurer, uh, individual supervisors to, uh, to identify and monitor uh, sectoral concentrations to specific uh, outsourcing firms um, and to detect where that concentration risk lies and that, that key provider risk. Well, now we know this, this ability to scale up across the globe is integral to the technology providers model, but at the same time, this jurisdiction-based uh, approach to regulation isn't well equipped to facilitate adequate oversight of these service providers. Again, global challenge. We need a global solution. Our focus will be on sharing uh, best practices and developing guidance on how to deal with this operational risk, including how to deal with the concentration risk in cooperation uh, with other financial standard setting bodies. On, lastly, on uh, another key area is on supervisory technology or soup tech, which we've heard a lot about in the last few days as well. Um, again, technology has, the, has the, the opportunity to radically change uh, the effectiveness of supervision, um, either by improving existing tools or bringing in new tools. But what we see across our members are real challenges about putting this into effect in developing and using these soup tech uh, applications. Issues like data quality, 
uh, computing capabilities, of course, human skills uh, and cost implications. So what we can do as the IIS is to bring members together to share lessons about how, can we how they can take forward soup tech strategies in a way that is appropriate to their market conditions and their own resources as well. So on fintech, this is the new normal. These are the issues that will affect all of our members, not only from developed countries, but emerging market uh, countries as well. This will undoubtedly be the key focus for the next five years of the IIS. And we've created forums like our IIS FinTech Forum, which is the platform for supervisory experts in FinTech to come together and exchange lessons uh, and promote guidance on how to deal with these issues best. But what is also clear is that we will need to build connections between our own IIS forum on these issues and other forums like uh, this Global Insurance Symposium to work collectively uh, on, these, on these issues. And then lastly, as I mentioned, another key focus for our period ahead is cyber, cyber risk. Uh, and regardless of the sources you look at, it's, it's striking that cyber risk is always identified in either the top one or top two issues that keep CEOs awake at night. It's the same amongst our members. There is no doubt that these cyber risks are growing, both in terms of prevalence uh, and their disruptive potential. And our members have uh, collectively agreed that this does need to be a top priority uh, for the future. Our work in this area is, 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 is three-pronged. Firstly, um, as you would expect, work on effective supervisory practices to help in, ensure uh, good cyber resilience in the insurance sector itself uh, and in insurers. Uh, there's nothing too new. We're building on what has been done in the banking and other sectors, uh, and we put out a paper on that late last year. So that uh, tick on progress on that. Secondly, uh, though, is, is looking at the uh, assessing the potential financial stability uh, implications of, of cyber risk uh, in the insurance sector which we will do in close cooperation with others like the Financial Stability Board. We know one major challenge is understanding the nature and scope of this risk, so more data uh, and more reliable cyber risk models are needed, and we will need to partner between supervisors and industry uh, on these challenges. Uh, and better identification and assessment of these vulnerabilities is a key part of our holistic framework to systemic risk going forward. Uh, but lastly, uh, in this area, we also want to look uh, at the insurance sector specific issues, particularly what is, what is the positive role that insurance can play in terms of promoting cyber resilience in the broader financial system and the broader economy. So this includes how insurers can help enhance cyber risk identification, mitigation, management, because of the risk expertise they have uh, and how supervisors can support that. But it also includes looking at the role of um, the unique role of insurers as takers of cyber risk, as cyber underwriters. And so we have kicked off a process to look at uh, the role of insurance supervisors in promoting sustainable cyber underwriting. And in the initial phase, we're focused on identifying uh, the key issues, so accumulation risk, appropriateness of data for effective modeling, terminology issues, capacity and coverage, in particular non-affirmative cover. So we're busy with this exploratory work on, based on which we, we will aim to provide insights to our members on how best to supervise what is a rapidly growing area of, of, of underwriting, but in a way that is sustainable. Uh, and given 
uh, the world leading role of the US in this market, in this cyber market, it's an area in which we will work closely with the NEIC uh, and US industry leaders. So, uh, in closing, I hope uh, I've given you a flavor that over the course of this year, 2019, a milestone year, the IIS will make significant progress on finalizing its part uh, of the post-crisis reform agenda and shifting to our new strategic direction for the next five years and that fintech and cyber will be uh, a substantial part of this new agenda. Much of this work will focus on the development of good supervisory practices. So in a way, the IIS is going back to its knitting, its foundation 25 years ago as a forum for exchange of supervisory lessons and good supervisory practices. And as we travel down this road, we will no doubt benefit from the work that has been going on here in the US, particularly through the, the, U, uh, through the NEIC uh, and in individual state supervisors uh, like, like Iowa. So let's say that though there is, is no real common prescription uh, for all of these challenges, there is a common interest in responding proactively to this new world. Uh, and from where I sit uh, within the IIS, 217 members, that is a unanimous common interest to how do insurance supervisors respond, evolve, react to this new world. And that same pioneering spirit of cooperation that led to the formation of the IIS 25 years ago calls on all of us collectively to continue to work together, to engage with one another, to find appropriate, practical, and proportionate approaches to protecting policyholders, achieving sustainable growth, and promoting financial stability in a period of rapid innovation and change. And the IIS provides the global forum uh, for these debates. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for sharing uh, that global perspective with us. And, and as we move forward, I'm excited now that we have somebody from the U.S. Department of Commerce here to share a little bit of a, what's going on at, in that department. We have Jim Sullivan. He was recently named uh, Assistant Secretary for Services in July of 2017. And in his role, he directs the U.S. Department of Commerce's efforts to strengthen the global competitiveness of U.S. services firms, which account for 80% of the nation's private sector economy. His primary areas of focus include the financial, digital, internet supply chain, and professional and business services industries. Prior to joining Commerce, Mr. Sullivan was co-founder and president of TechOut, a software as a service provider of an on-demand ordering solutions to information and communication technology and digital media companies. Before that, he served as manage, managing director and general counsel of Clover Investment Group, a private equity firm focused on lower middle market hospitality and technology businesses. Previously, from 1999 to 2006, he practiced law in Washington, D.C. as a member of the White Collar Defense Teams at Morrison, Forrester, and DLA Piper. Will you please welcome Jim Sullivan. I'm either getting really old or I'm going to have to uh, tighten up my bio. It sounded a little, little long-winded. I'll have to cut it down for you in the future. Um, I just want to say good afternoon, uh, everyone. And on behalf of the uh, Department of Commerce, um, I am very pleased to be here today to discuss some of the key challenges and opportunities uh, for U.S. insurers in international markets. Uh, in the modern global economy, insuring risks really is a multidimensional undertaking. Uh, insurance, as you all very well know, is a complex business that interacts uh, with many aspects of our lives. Um, and the importance of the industry 
uh, to our economy in the United States is reflected uh, by its sheer size, uh, by the number of jobs it's generating, by the total amount of assets under management, and its contribution to our GDP. But I think insurance also plays a far more fundamental role as a key precondition uh, for sustained economic growth. Insurance increases the general savings rate, which creates deeper markets, it enables more investments. In addition, by decreasing the level of unnecessary precautionary savings, insurance helps allocate more working capital to other more productive uses across our economy. Uh, now, insurers, of course, are no strangers to government, and few other industries are as tightly regulated and supervised. Uh, but at the International Trade Administration, where I work at the Commerce Department, uh, our mandate really is a bit different uh, from most other government actors in this space. Uh, at ITA, as we call it, our core mission is really about helping uh, to create the conditions for U.S. industry uh, to innovate and to compete around the world. So with that in mind, my goal this afternoon really is uh, threefold. I guess first I wanted to explain a bit about how we in ITA uh, and the administration more broadly are working to address market access challenges that uh, affect the U.S. insurance industry. Uh, second, I want to describe some of our efforts to help foster the new technologies that are really uh, transforming the insurance sector. And third, I want to ask for your input and your feedback uh, and your continued collaboration going forward. Uh, before I dive in, though, as a preliminary matter, I do want to thank the Greater Des Moines Partnership, uh, the Iowa Insurance Division, Commissioner Doug Oman, the Federation of Iowa Insurers, and the Iowa Economic Development Authority for the kind invitation to be here today. So as we all know, uh, U.S. insurers are uh, clearly, and I think unequivocally, among the most innovative and competitive uh, in the world. I think there are about 6,000 insurance companies in the United States. Uh, we have about 2.7 million industry employees, uh, and together they contributed over $600 billion, which is roughly 3% of our GDP, and that was in 2017. Uh, today, the situation we're looking at internationally uh, is global insurance premiums standing at about $5 trillion. And unfortunately, uh, U.S. insurers often face a great variety of market access and other foreign trade barriers, uh, including prohibitions and restrictions on foreign participation in a given market, discriminatory licensing and uh, regulatory standards, and barriers to cross-border data flows, um, increasingly in the form of data localization measures. Uh, U.S. insurers seeking to enter countries like China, Malaysia, India, and Indonesia, among others, are subject to these restrictions on foreign ownership that I just mentioned. Um, and as a result, what we see is U.S. insurers' market share in China, for example, remains disturbingly low at approximately 3%. Uh, at present, China is the world's second largest insurance market, but will overtake the United States uh, within about 10 years with over 30% of global premium income and about one-third of 3.7 trillion of new premiums that are expected to be written globally in the next decade will be written in China. India, which also ranks well below global averages for insurance penetration and density, represents another fantastic opportunity for U.S. industry. But again, unfortunately, in recent years, uh, industry raised its foreign ownership cap from 26 percent to 49 percent. And its ownership and control guidelines uh, issued by the government required all existing joint ventures, including those who had absolutely no intention uh, of increasing their investment beyond 26 percent, to go back and to modify their existing agreements to comply with this new cap. Uh, Malaysia, too, imposes foreign equity caps of about 70 percent. And while Malaysia reportedly does allow foreign insurance companies to invest more than 70 percent, um, if a quote-unquote best interest test is met, uh, the Malaysian government has yet to issue any guidelines defining how that test is achieved or what that scenario looks like. So in addition to equity caps, uh, you, your industry is facing a range of discriminatory regulations around the world, such as restrictions on cross-border reinsurance trade. Uh, U.S. reinsurers have seen an increase in the number of countries proposing or imposing such restrictions, and that naturally reduces their ability to manage risk efficiently. Data localization measures, which I cited just a moment ago, uh, these require, for those who may not be as familiar, 
uh, companies to store or process their data locally within national borders. Uh, they have proliferated uh, increasingly in recent years as well. They've been implemented by countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Brunei, Iran, China, Brazil, India, Australia, Korea, Nigeria, and Russia, just to name a few. And they're put in place for a variety of reasons. Uh, some governments uh, have stated that they are motivated by a desire to protect consumer privacy, uh, or enhance cybersecurity, or ensure national authority or national security. Others more openly acknowledge the fact that they are engaging in digital protectionism uh, to help incubate their own homegrown industries, much like China has done. Uh, the reality is that none of these rationales really hold up for localization. Uh, if you locate data within a given jurisdiction, that in and of itself does not afford privacy or security benefits. Uh, in fact, to the contrary, it puts privacy and security at greater risk by enabling greater government access to your data, by expanding vulnerability to cyber threats, and by minimizing uh, availability and access uh, to data security tools that are offered by global cloud providers uh, wherever they're located. Uh, it also, quite frankly, harms the growth and competitiveness of the economy putting those measures in place by effectively introducing a tax that thwarts their, their global growth and competitiveness. Uh, for, for this audience, most, most relevant is the fact that localization poses a rapidly growing threat uh, to an expanding number of US industries, including the insurance industry. Uh, in many cases, we are seeing the costs and regulatory burdens uh, of localization are causing US firms to withdraw uh, from operations in key markets or forego them altogether. And frankly, we're seeing, unfortunately, growing fragmentation of the internet. So what are we doing at ITA and the administration in response to these challenges that I just outlined? Um, the president has been clear um, that it, one of his core goals is to break down trade barriers and make sure that Americans have uh, access to new opportunities to increase their exports. And to that end, we are among other things, modernizing existing trade agreements and working to develop new ones. Uh, with, the U, uh, excuse me, with the new United States-Canada-Mexico agreement, or I keep wanting to call it NAFTA, so I always get it wrong, USMCA, uh, the president has kept his promise to modernize NAFTA. Uh, and it really has turned out, I think, to be a mutually beneficial win uh, for North American farmers, ranchers, businesses, uh, and workers. Uh, but because of what I was just talking about a moment ago, because increasingly with the digitization we're seeing across a growing number of industries, uh, and because our economy more and more relies on the seamless flow of data across borders, uh, the administration prioritized uh, securing a first-of-its-kind digital trade chapter uh, to facilitate cross-border data flows that allow companies of all sizes and, and all industries to leverage data to help create efficiencies, productivity, to come up with new products and services. Um, and the chapter was also explicit in making sure that we prevent businesses from having to store data locally. Uh, the administration is also actively engaged, as I'm sure most of you know, in ongoing negotiations with China, with the European Union, with the United Kingdom, and with Japan. The goal there across all of those uh, is to help ensure fair and reciprocal access for American products and services to those markets. Uh, in our trade talks with China, I do want to just quickly acknowledge uh, Ambassador Brenstad, former governor of this great state. I think he's doing a remarkable job um, as a representative of the United States in Beijing. Um, negotiations with China at a high level are focused uh, on several key structural issues uh, related to forced technology transfer, uh, theft of intellectual property, um, and again, as I've been talking about, market access for a variety of U.S. industries including the insurance industry. Uh, you may have heard that the United States Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Treasury Secretary Mnuchin will be heading back to Beijing uh, to continue those discussions next week. Uh, we are also uh, very active now with the European Union. And uh, again, I'm probably sharing information that you're all well aware of, but the relationship with the EU, uh, or between the EU and the United States is among the largest in the world. Our trade and investment relationship generates now over $5.5 trillion in commercial sales a year and employs 15 million workers on both sides of the Atlantic. 
Uh, in 2017 alone, U.S. direct investment in the EU came to $3.2 trillion, while direct investment by the EU in the United States totaled about $2.4 trillion. Uh, we have established now a working group to discuss what we regard as several important issues uh, with the EU, including on the topic of tariffs, standards, and trade barriers to U.S. services firms and providers. Uh, and the objectives of our, our meetings to date really have been to identify a short list of uh, deliverables that the EU can meet to demonstrate its commitment to working with the U.S. government to reduce our trade imbalance. Uh, I would also like to note that last December, uh, the United States Trade Representative again and the Treasury Department's Federal Insurance Office, FIO, signed a bilateral agreement with the U.K. on prudential measures regarding insurance and reinsurance. Uh, this agreement, for those who are familiar with it, is entirely consistent with the steps that were taken uh, with the uh, agreement that the administration signed in 2017 with the EU, the EU-US covered agreement. Uh, that 2017 agreement uh, on insurance with the European Union really did help level the playing field for US-based insurers and reinsurers operating in Europe. Um, and it also, frankly, confirmed that the existing US insurance regulatory regime uh, is more than equal to the task of uh, ensuring insurance sector oversight, policyholder protection, and national and global financial stability. Uh, the 2018 US-UK covered agreement, which was negotiated and concluded after very significant engagement with US stakeholders and with state regulatory community uh, and authorities, uh, really is an important step for us in maintaining regulatory certainty and market continuity as the United Kingdom prepares to exit the European Union. Uh, both covered agreements affirm the competitiveness of U.S. companies in domestic and foreign markets, and I think uh, made tremendous strides in making regulations more efficient and effective. Um, just some quick facts, uh, again, which many may know. The United Kingdom is the fourth largest insurance market in the world, uh, and insurance and other financial services play critical roles in both the United States and the British economies. Together, our insurance and financial services sectors employ almost 8.5 million people and account for more than a quarter of our bilateral services trade. Um, on the topic of Brexit, uh, I do want to note that the United States is prepared for any outcome and continues to work very closely with governments, uh, the EU government, uh, but also with the British government, with regulators uh, across the continent, and systemically important financial institutions to protect U.S. interests. Uh, I was told that uh, Ms. Julianne Cox, who is Vice Counsel for Financial Services at the UK Department for International Trade, is with us today, so I would like to just take a moment to recognize her for her great efforts in the Brexit process. Uh, finally, on Japan, in September of last year, the President and the Japanese Prime Minister Abe uh, agreed to enter into negotiations for a U.S.-Japan trade agreement as well. And we are very aware of the importance of the Japanese market for U.S. insurers and the great success that many have seen um, there or, and achieved there over the years. So again, I do want to make sure that um, you're all aware we, we very much appreciate industry feedback and input and would welcome input on this FTA as well uh, as the negotiating objectives are finalized. Um, so I've touched a lot on some of the challenges we're dealing with. I would like to take a few moments to address um, some of the opportunities. And the administration is, is very keen on ensuring that U.S. industry and the U.S. insurance industry in particular can capitalize on the many opportunities uh, that are afforded now by the emergence of, among other things, InsureTech. Um, many of you are, again, very, very aware that digitization and technology are transforming the insurance industry. Uh, in claims processing and distribution and in underwriting, the explosion we're seeing in data uh, is enabling insurers to develop far more tailored policies almost in real time. Uh, in addition, we're now with AI and blockchain technologies, we're seeing uh, rapid streamlining of interactions between policyholders and insurers as well. Uh, we have heard, for example, about the use uh, here at this conference of advanced analytics in the insurance industry uh, in earlier sessions today uh, and during yesterday's FinTech Mini Expo. Uh, AI algorithms are being used to create risk profiles. They allow for the purchase of an auto, commercial, or life policy to be completed virtually in minutes now. 
uh, to help prevent road accidents and related claims. Insurance companies are using AI and customer data uh, by permission to recognize, uh, for example, GPS patterns to help discern road and traffic conditions. Industry leaders like Liberty Mutual, Allstate, Progressive, and State Farm are already implementing machine learning applications to monitor driver performance and market trends to help inform the development of new products as well. Uh, the administration is very clear-eyed about some of the potential challenges and the hype surrounding AI, uh, but at the same time, it is very enthusiastic about the enormous promise to enhance living standards for Americans. Uh, it can help improve our health through better diagnoses, uh, keep us safe as we continue to improve self-driving vehicles, uh, and it can help ensure and sustain our nation's scientific, technological, and economic leadership in the world. Uh, last February, the President issued a new executive order on artificial intelligence uh, in which he recognized the critical importance of AI to the American economy. And uh, I do want to note that I think about a month ago, the White House launched AI.gov uh, to highlight various AI initiatives across the federal government. Uh, the United States has been working very closely with the Organization uh, of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, over the last several months now uh, to help develop some principles that can foster trust in and adoption of artificial intelligence. Uh, ITA and I will be traveling uh, to Paris to attend some of those discussions at the OECD next month. And I think one of the reasons we uh, really look to the OECD, it's, it's an evidence-based, consensus-based fora, um, but it's also, it, it's multi-stakeholder nature, I think, is uh, critical to ensuring credibility and legitimacy. Uh, so in addition to government sitting down at the table uh, for these discussions, we are joined by representatives from the private sector, uh, technical experts, and representatives of civil society as well. Uh, they've been involved in the process since the beginning, and again, I, I do think that's, that's critical for a variety of reasons. I think we're very pleased uh, to see that the OECD seems to have reached a consensus on these issues with some draft recommendations, and we're hopeful that they will approve it and publish it in short order. Uh, in addition to AI, I want to just share a bit about uh, what we're doing in terms of monitoring developments with blockchain technology. Um, again, many of you are probably more familiar uh, and more technically deep than I on blockchain, but basically um, I'm talking about enterprise blockchain as opposed to just specifically uh, the more commonly recognized Bitcoin um, affiliation that many often make between the technology and that application. But it's basically a decentralized, shared, and um, for the most part, unalterable ledger for recording transactions. Uh, there are an, uh, a growing number of use cases that we're seeing for this technology. Again, there is some hype, but I think some of the places where we're really seeing practical application is financial services, um, supply chain management, and insurance. Um, it really is growing based on our engagement with industry uh, in the insurance sector. Uh, the shipping company Maersk, for example, I know has teamed up with EY with insurers XL Catlin and MS Emlin and the broker Willis Towers Watson to create a system uh, which should lead to far more efficient insurance policies that are, are more narrowly tailored to Maersk's needs. Uh, Singapore-based Fidencia X has established the, first, uh, the world's first marketplace for tradable insurance policies where consumers can go to buy, to, to sell, or store their insurance policies on the company's blockchain. Uh, and another example, the Switzerland-based blockchain insurance initiative, uh, industry initiative, B3i, um, is a cohort of insurers that was formed to explore the utility of blockchain and distributed ledger technology uh, in the insurance industry. And the basic mandate of the initiative uh, is to understand how the technology can improve the way data and payments are managed to reduce risk and to make insurance far more affordable than it currently is. Uh, we're also meeting on a regular basis with a growing number of startups in the blockchain space. So at ITA, we really are uh, endeavoring to stay abreast of how blockchain is changing business models, uh, again, in the insurance industry, but also elsewhere. Uh, we are working with some of them to bring them to international markets. Uh, I was in Singapore in November for the Singapore Sin uh, FinTech Festival, Sintech, excuse me, FinTech Festival, uh, 
where, among other things, I had the privilege of highlighting how enterprise blockchain can help make U.S. companies more competitive uh, and how we can lead in this space. Uh, at the Commerce Department, we have another sister bureau, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, for those who are interested, I invite you to uh, take a look at their just published report on blockchain technology. It provides an overview, um, very detailed, highly technical, but for those who are so inclined, uh, very illuminating. Um, both ITA and NIST have established uh, a Commerce Department blockchain working group where we coordinate on blockchain issues within the department and within the federal government. Uh, so in the meantime, we're continuing to monitor how the insurance industry evolves its use of blockchain technology uh, and AI as well, as I noted, to maintain and ensure that U.S. industry remains competitive in international markets. Uh, so as I noted at the outset, our fundamental mission really is to help create the conditions around the world for U.S. industry innovation and U.S. industry competitiveness. Uh, and the way we do that uh, is with our staff in Washington, uh, with our staff throughout the United States, and our staff across the world. Uh, the ITA network now has, uh, I think, close to 2,200 people uh, globally. We have 106 offices in 48 states in Puerto Rico. Uh, and in 75 countries around the world. And I believe, uh, I know we have an office here in Des Moines as well. This network really does allow us to provide economic and market intelligence to American businesses that are interested in exporting uh, and to investors as well who are exploring uh, foreign direct investment opportunities here in the United States. Uh, one of my teams that I oversee, that I have the privilege of overseeing, is our Office of Finance and Insurance Industries. Uh, that office leads on trade policy and promotion work on behalf of U.S. financial services and insurance firms. I know many of you in this room interface with the director of that office, Paul Thanos, so I just want to recognize Paul for all of his hard work uh, on this and so many other issues. And Paul, I did not see you when I came in. I saw you in it. So thank you, Paul Thanos. Um, Paul's office uh, engages in a wide variety uh, of endeavors on some of the issues I've already touched on. They are at the table when we're negotiating bilateral trade agreements. Uh, they help lead trade missions to foreign markets. Uh, Paul himself is the leader of the U.S. delegation to OECD Insurance and Private Pensions um, delegation to the OECD. Um, he participates in export credit negotiations. Uh, we're engaged both in the OECD and the International Working Group. Uh, and on a daily basis, they are working on insurance and private pension issues around the world. Uh, the team and I are very fortunate to work with some of the finest trade associations I've had the privilege of dealing with since I took this job, uh, including ACLI, APCIA, RIA, as well as NAIC. Uh, I do want to give a special mention to Principal Financial Group. I had the pleasure of meeting with the President and CEO for Principal this morning, Luis Valdez, at their spectacular new headquarters here in Des Moines. Uh, so thank you for that. I know the team uh, has worked now with Principal for nearly a decade on a variety of projects and issues, uh, and it has been our pleasure uh, during my term to work together as well. Um, I do want to be clear, we support all our insurance and pension businesses globally, large and small. Uh, we leverage our, our foreign commercial service I just spoke about a moment ago uh, in countries like China, Mexico, India, Brazil, and Indonesia to make sure that businesses are getting fair access. Um, and as I noted at, at the outset again, um, we can't do our job unless we're engaging with and hearing from industry uh, and other stakeholders. I don't think anyone wants us developing policy in the abstract. So again, I would encourage you uh, to reach out to our office to let us know what your concerns, your feedback, your recommendations are so that we can better serve uh, the industry and American businesses and workers. So thank you for this opportunity to speak this afternoon, and uh, I appreciate the invitation being here. Thank you. We want to thank Mr. Sullivan for his uh, participation in our conference. We appreciate his comments on the opportunities and challenges that U.S. insurers face 
uh, inter in international markets and the administration's foreign trade activities. So thank you very much for that. Also, thank you to uh, Mr. Thanos for his help uh, in our planning and uh, getting Mr. Sullivan here. So uh, next up, we're going to take a break. And after this, we're going to have the final presentation for the businesses that have been involved in the Global Insurance Accelerator. So that'll start at 3.30 promptly. Brian Hemisath, the director, will lead us through those activities. So we'll take a break. And if you would come back into the room around 3.25, we'll get the presentation started right at 3.30, and I'd encourage you to stay around and hear about the exciting work that's happening with the startups that are involved in the program. So thank you. Thank you.